Welcome to this colloquium, spring colloquium of the Center for Studies in Higher Education. I'm Michael Nocht, Interim Director of the Center, and it's my pleasure uh, to host the event and welcome you here. I'm glad we have a lovely crowd despite the weather. Uh, a, a testimony to the attraction of our speakers. Uh, just a word about coming attractions. We have a very full schedule of colloquia this semester, more than we've had in the past. We have maybe three or more per month, which is a lot. Uh, two of my Goldman School colleagues, David Kirp and uh, Michael O'Hare, will be speaking uh, quite soon. We have a very interesting, uh, not a debate, but a comparative analysis of distance learning between Stanford and Berkeley with Mitchell Stevens of Stanford and Diana Wu of Berkeley. And in April, uh, really some special major events that Carol Christ will host. The Kerr Lectures, we have three former university presidents who will be speaking here. Mike McPherson of Carleton College, uh, Rick Levin of Yale, and Larry Backow of Tufts. And a whole series of events each week, three different weeks in April, so there's a lot that you're able to take advantage of if you're interested. Uh, today we have uh, two very senior. <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and distinguished. Pushing 80. <laughs> and distinguished uh, faculty, I guess, failing retirement. Um, Michael Kirst and Dick Scott. Michael has uh, spoken here before to rave reviews, and I'm sure he and Dick will follow suit this time. Uh, Michael, as you know, is a uh, specialist on the politics of education. He did his doctoral work at Harvard, and he's been uh, a faculty member in the Graduate School of Education at Stanford for most of his career. He's now emeritus. He's also president of the California State Board of Education, which is, I think, the policy advisory arm for the State Department of Education, and has written extensively on many subjects. Uh, Dick Scott is an organizational sociologist who uh, received his degree from Chicago, also most of his career at Stanford in the sociology department. He's been chair of sociology and author of 20 books and 250 articles, all of which I've memorized. Um, so they're going to speak today on a very interesting question, which is about uh, higher education in Silicon Valley how to think about it, what's needed, why it might be connected but conflicted, and we very much look forward to their remarks. So please welcome Michael Kirst and Dick Scott. Well, thank you for coming today and uh, on such a rainy day, and we look forward to an interactive uh, discussion with you. And uh, we are going to present our forthcoming book, and you see the uh, <clears throat> title up there. Uh, and actually, as you'll, uh, this is uh, not just about Silicon Valley, it's about the Bay Area, as I'll indicate. And our book will be published by Johns Hopkins University Press in 2017. Uh, and it uh, is, uh, both Dick and I worked on a prior book with Mitchell Stevens called Remaking College, The Changing Ecology of Higher Education. So we look at the whole scene of post-secondary education. Uh, any entity that's out there, uh, and you'll hear more about that as we uh, go along. If I could just say one word, uh, Mike and I are the senior authors on this, but we have a collection of junior authors that are contributed or are listed on the individual chapters, a group of uh, uh, researchers and doctoral students from the School of Education and the uh, John Gardner Center. So we had good, good assistance from junior colleagues. Good, okay, thank you. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is a study of the Bay Area, not just of Silicon Valley, but our publisher said anything with Silicon Valley in the title sells, so <laughs> you've got to distort this and call it all Berkeley as part of Silicon Valley and so on. Uh, so that's uh, what we're doing, and we did not include Sonoma County, for example, uh, and, and so it's uh, the inner ring of the Bay Area. Uh, and uh, what is distinctive about where we were going with this in part is that there's not much research on regional post-secondary education. We, we're amazed at how little there is. Most students in the United States 
go to post-secondary education in their region. And uh, this is really a comparative desert of education. So uh, we believe we have not been able to find any deeper study than ours uh, of, uh, of, high, of regional higher education. And so there's a lot in here. The book is 304 pages long. Uh, so we're just going to present some highlights and particularly focus on policy implications and that sort of thing. So my as, uh, practices in K-12 education, where I'm in my fourth term as the president of the State Board of Education, and the first and fourth terms were separated by 40 years. And the <laughs> correlation there is Jerry Brown. I've advised him in education <laughs> since 1974. But my research is in post-secondary education, which avoids conflicts of interest with my uh, state position. So uh, our study then is uh, of the total uh, uh, San Francisco Bay Area higher education ecology. Uh, and it is longitudinal over time, and there's, of course, as we'll talk about, many shifts and demands uh, that have been made into this uh, area. Uh, we focus particularly on the links uh, between colleges and industry uh, and the challenges that come out of that, and we're, as you'll see at the end, we're broadening that focus uh, to look at the Bay Area labor market with our next steps on this work, and uh, more about that as we go along. So the research activity uh, was, uh, as you can see, uh, the key informants. Um, we, we did this historically uh, from the 1970s through to 216, uh, studying what's been going on in the region. Uh, we have a quantitative base to this study, and you'll see a little of that. <coughs> Uh, our, we talked about the iPad census and so on. We have a whole appendix about how poor the data is in the domain of higher education. We found at that at, in 216, uh, in 215, 375 institutions of post-secondary education in the Bay Area. Many of these we had to go on websites. As you know, a lot of the private entities are sanctioned by the Department of Consumer Affairs. So if Dick and I wanted to open a higher education institution, it's like getting a business license for a hot dog stand off of Sather Gate or something. So it, it really, a lot of these are fugitive institutions. Some of us would only talk to us in Mandarin. We had a Mandarin staff member, uh, and they're all over the place. Um, uh, actually, that was one called Northwest University, somewhere down near Hayward. So there's a lot out there that are way below, beneath the radar. Of the 350 institutions in the total ecology, 30 of those are public. 30. So the debates in California that I participate are overwhelmingly about public education, and the state master plan has very little to do with non-public education, and we think that's a, a long overdue for re-examination in terms of state policy. And then we also did uh, case studies uh, up here in the, uh, uh, in the East Bay. Uh, for example, we did Hayward State, uh, the Peralta Community College District, Holy Names College, and DeVry, uh, which is down, uh, a for-profit, D-E-V-R-Y, down as a, in, uh, uh, near Fremont, California, right over the, the bridge there. So uh, our focus was on uh, colleges rather than students. Again, we find the bulk of the research in higher education has the students as a unit of analysis, and very too few take a long, longitudinal look of the, inst of the impacts of, of regional change and demographic change and economic change uh, on the actual colleges. Uh, and so uh, the broad, our focus is on, uh, particularly we focused on broad access institutions. Most of the research focuses on more selective institutions. Uh, and uh, we then uh, look at organizational fields. Dick will talk about that in a minute uh, and uh, in and, and that regard. Um, Yeah, I don't know. That's a uh, that's a, a good topic. Uh, a lot of them wouldn't be accredited by WASC. We'll talk a whole lot about reskilling, and they don't really care. Yeah, we have that. Dick can talk about that. 
But a whole lot of these, uh, when you look at the list, I don't think WASC would look at them. And as you know, increasingly employers, it's not so, it's, they're more interested in what you know and in and, and that regard. So let me let Dick yeah, we follow a, we in on a, that. We have a slide coming up and, uh, for example, 119 of them were in iPads. Uh, the the and, and one of the qualifications for, for being that is being a degree-getting institution and eligible for federal assistance. And so about a third of them are sort of on the radar screen and, and under some regulatory umbrella, and the rest are not. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Okay, I think Dick will now take on from here for a while. All right. Uh, I have, have for some time thought that a very useful way to think about the world of organizations is to think about the fact that they are sort of aggregated or collected into fields of organizations. And these are organizations that are doing sort of similar kind of work or supporting organizations that are doing that kind of work. And so higher education, for example, can be regarded as a field of organizations that includes the major types of providers, the community colleges, the for-profits, the research universities, all these kind of organizations. So there's a variety of types of organizations. And they, and it also, the field also includes those organizations that are clearly strongly interdep interdependent with them. They're providing critical resources or they are providing constraints and controls on these organizations. And so a field, uh, approach in, in this case would look at the types of, of organizations that are providing higher education services. It would look at support organizations and in the case of higher education, we're thinking about all the kinds of regulatory structures at the federal and state and regional, not too many, but at local levels of, of control systems. And a huge uh, complex of professional systems that organize uh, university systems and research organizations and state colleges, they all have their major associations. All the disciplinary associations that faculty are associated with, all of the uh, academic, major academic officers of universities are, are connected to their own professional association, the finance officers, the registrars, all these groups have their associations. And so there's a huge complex of, of collegial, normatively oriented structures that provide guidance about how do you be a how do you be a, a registrar and how do you be an admissions officer and, or how do you be a sociology professor and what does that mean and what are the standards you need to uphold and so there so there are these wider uh, 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 structures of constraint and support that are operative in the higher education field that have an in, enormous impact on what they do and how they do it. And they're, I think, largely ignored uh, by, the, by the sort of popular literature. Uh, every field is controlled by a set of what we call institutional logics, that is a shared set of beliefs, a, a, a sense about what kind of business are we in, what kind of world do we operate in, what are the important goals of this world, what are the important obstacles, how, what are the major ways in which you carry out this world, uh, this work, and so there's a set of, of understandings about the nature of the work we're in and how the work is done, and, and, then, and those are common to the field. And then finally, there are a set of governance structures that operate at the field level. These are the regulatory, the, the normative associations that I, I just mentioned. And so there's a set of control structures or governance systems that are operative. And so one of the things we did was to say, in order to understand higher education, and, and, and in order to understand the behavior of individual colleges, you need to think about this wider range of forces within which they operate. Uh, the, 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 there are two major kinds of field forces that organizational sociologists have focused on. Isometric forces that sort of force people to do things similarly and to look like your colleagues and so on. And those are very prompt, very dominant and predominant in higher education. You have to, you know, you have to figure out what a research university is, what it does, what it looks like, how it behaves, and so on. And we learn this. Uh, Berkeley learns this from Stanford, Stanford learns this from Berkeley, and so on. We're all watching each other. 
But there's also, at a field level, a set of competitive processes that are generated as we try to compete and stand out and, and be somewhat distinctive and so on. And over time, as you go through this period from 1970 up to, up to 2015 or so on, the competitive pressures have, have, I think, become stronger over time and the isomorphic pressures somewhat diminished over time. Uh, but there are many ways in, to in which to think about the conception of field and to, and to apply it to a study like this. We see colleges as being a part of a second field that is a regionally organized field. And now you have to change the focus entirely and say what kind of a field do, or, do organizations at it within the Silicon Valley area, what kind of a field is this? And it's a field com composed, of course, of high-tech firms. And these now become the, the, the focal players. Unlike colleges, you shift attention from the colleges who become support structures to the high-tech firms and the producer organizations. And, and, you know, and some of these are, are huge, and some of them are uh, you know, startups involving one or two people operating out of a garage. And then, again, a set of support structures, and these include the venture capitalist people, the, the law firms, which have played a really interesting role in, in figuring out how to help these engineers act like real organizations and, 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 and behave like they're real people and, and uh, you, know, how, you know, how to raise money and, and how to manage people and so on. All the, and, and the law schools have been important consultants in this process. There are all kinds of laboratories and institutes that, that, that support this structure, all the way from the kind of, of, of structures that operate out of Berkeley to Nassau to other kinds of groups that operate in the Bay Area. And of course, the colleges themselves are a part of this larger field structure. And the logics in the, if you think about this as a regional field, the logic in this are, are, are much more focused toward entrepreneurship, toward innovation, toward risk taking. Those are the kind of logics that dominate in that world. And the governance structures are primarily uh, market structures, competitive processes, of, of course, but also, as Saxinian and, uh, and others have taught us, there's a lot of, of informal network kinds of structures that really provide a lot of glue in the labor markets, markets and among the among the, uh, among the players of this field. Uh, there are also uh, uh, various kinds of, of, uh, of badges or indicators about what constitutes uh, qualifications and so on, and a set of special certificates and digital badges have grown up in here to help provide some kind of, 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 of governance mechanisms for, for this field. And so you have two very different kinds of fields that are operating in this world. And if you compare them, we see considerable difference in the kind of governance structures that are present, in the kind of logics that are present, uh, in the planning horizons that they operate with, and in the pace of, ch of, of change. Now, these forces operate more on some kinds of colleges than on others. And there are some that are sort of more mainstream, like Stanford and Mills and Santa Clara and so on, that are very much subject to the higher education forces. And there are other kinds of colleges that are very much on the periphery and hardly uh, pay any attention at all to the educational logics that are much con more controlled by a set of market logics. And so there's a, a good bit of, of, of variation in terms of how strong these pressures are. But in general, in the modal organization in higher education, the governance structures that are primarily uh, salient are the, the, the state and federal uh, rules and laws, the professional norms, and, uh, and then most of, the, uh, most of the sort of more market-like controls that operate are more input uh, focused on, you care about the, the qualifications of the faculty you hire, you have someone review your curriculum, a lot of input controls as opposed to focusing on the quality of the graduates or the kind of jobs they get. Most of those uh, uh, controls are, are, are very dim and weak in higher education. Whereas uh, by contrast, in the Silicon Valley, it's much more on market controls and on a set of uh, outcome <coughs> indicators that, that really uh, govern the behavior of these groups. Institutional logics, you have the uh, liberal arts logic versus the practical uh, uh, arts. 
it's not, it's not what you know, it's what you can do, it's, it's not your knowledge base, it's, it's your know-how, it's your can-do that's, that's matter, that, that's, a, that's of importance. And so, although uh, one of the distinctive things about Silicon Valley is there's a lot of, of uh, appreciation about the importance of knowledge, what you mean by knowledge varies considerably between the higher education group and the Silicon Valley group. And so there are these tensions that are sort of built in to, to the relationships that operate at the field level. The planning horizons, and this we found was really uh, quite, uh, quite different, both the planning horizons and the pace of change. Universities are operating on a very different time scale than Silicon Valley. Uh, colleges are operating in a very different world than Silicon Valley. Uh, we're not getting products out to market that may be obsolete if they're not out in two weeks. We are not in that business at all. Uh, we care about preserving the, the long-term uh, uh, accumulated knowledge of the past and, and taking care of that and passing it on to our, to our uh, uh, students and so on. And uh, uh, Mike and I think that this is a very important book, and, and it, but it, this book has been in manuscript form for two years, and it's still three, several months away from being published. We're on a completely different time schedule. The university presses say, oh yeah, we can get that done right away. What about a year or, or 18 months from now? You know, and that's really fast. <laughs> so it's a different world. These are really different kinds of, uh, and so that's why we say these, these worlds are connected, uh, they really are both concerned about knowledge and about trying to improve a variety of kinds of things. They clearly are interacting. They're tr clearly trying to work together, but they are also conflicted. There are lots of reasons and lots of constraints why uh, these organizations can't respond nearly quick enough. So that just for example, uh, if, if, if a, a community college or a state college wants to introduce a new course in the curriculum, it's about a two-year process of planning, collegial input, getting approval from the deans, passing it up to Sacramento, and, and getting it reviewed and come back. And by that time, the company says, no, no, we don't need that anymore. We're doing something completely different. So it's a, it's just, it's a different, different world. Okay, now just a few more words ab about the, the wider context in which our study was going on. It, this is a Extraordinarily, as you know, if you try to drive around the block, it's a busy, uh, active, uh, crowded world that we live in here. Um, we've seen a substantial population increase over time. Um, uh, in, the, in, in, a, in a relatively short period, uh, the proportion of whites has, has systematically gone down over time. The proportion of blacks has, has gone down somewhat less. They tend to be driven out by the high cost of this area, whereas the Asian population and the Hispanic population have been uh, changing uh, dramatically. All these things enormously affect the work that colleges do, the work that higher education does. There's a very much more diverse student pool than there was today than there was in 1970, 1980. In the same way, the tech sector, sector has gone through extraordinary change. This is a wonderful diagram we, we stole from uh, the Silicon Valley Competitiveness Group that talks about the, the sort of dominant industries in the tech sector over time. And you move from uh, the early days of defense contracts and with the Lockheed and, and those kind of groups to the development of integrated circuits, to the development of the personal computer, to the development of the internet, to the development of uh, social media groups and, and the uh, Facebook groups and so on. And of course, we're now beginning to move into cybersecurity and other kinds of, of and, and so what industries are dominant in the Silicon Valley has really changed over the, over the, the four decades that we're talking about. And what kinds of, therefore, what kind of skills you need, what kind of, um, of uh, uh, people you need uh, to do the work has also undergone change. Uh, to get back to the place where Mike began, uh, we, we tried as a part of the study to simply uh, determine how many organizations in higher education there were in this world. 
and uh, by relying on iPads, which is the standard source that most uh, researchers in higher education rely on, we found that there, uh, it, it uh, identified about a third of the programs in the Bay Area that are actually providing higher education. And um, the, uh, the ones that are missing are ones that I think are doing a good bit of the important work. That includes the, uh, the places uh, particularly uh, like uh, the, the boot camps, the computer learning groups, those kind of groups that, that have recently come in and, and there are a good many uh, of, of these programs that provide uh, really fairly basic resources and, re and training and retraining for, for the population in this area. Uh, one of, I think one of the major policy uh, implications for us is that we just need to know a lot more about who's actually providing higher education and under what, under what systems are they operating and what are the controls that are at work or, or not at work. We don't even know, the, the, don't have the basic information we need to know who is, who, is, uh, um, who is engaged in any way in this sector. And that's a real, I think, uh, from a policy standpoint, it's a disaster. If you don't, if you don't know who's, who's active in the sector, then it's very hard to make policy or, or to make uh, any kind of uh, decisions about what, what should be done to, to make things better. Uh, we really uh, uh, looked at a couple of the kinds of ways in which organizations are adapting over time to the changes in the environment in which they're operating. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the ways, of course, is by selection over time the numbers of different kinds of organizations have changed over time. Now, if you're an uh, uh, organizational ec ecologist, you'd say, well, it's surprising in many ways over the long period how stable the sector is. That's a characteristic of higher education. There's not a lot of change over time, particularly in the public side. For example, as Mike is fond of pointing out, there are three major state colleges in 1970 in this area. There are three major colleges of higher education. You know, the San Jose State, State's, Cal yeah. State. There are just still, still just three. There's very little change in sort of the, the basic, the, in the public providers in this system, uh, with the exception of the, the uh, community colleges did grow rapidly before this chart began, between 60 and 70, and then have continued to increase somewhat since 1970. And the, the nonprofit colleges have been the most volatile. They, they grew earlier, and now uh, in the last decade or so, they're in decline. And the ones that are still hanging on, we found, are the ones that have really shifted from, from serving sort of liberal arts pr uh, programs to much more vocational programs. They really, uh, and so, there, so ch change goes on by selection. That is, the organization dies or not, or, or a new organization has come to existence, or it changes by adaptation. That is, the same organization does something differently. And, but the first way in which we want to talk about this is changes over time in by selection. And you know, the most change, of course, is shown in the rise of a whole new type of provider, the for-profit colleges. And, and this just tracks the ones that are giving degrees, so it's an understatement of the for-profit providers. These data are, are, these data are primarily focused on the degree-granting degree granting institutions, which we know is a small subset of those. And what we, what we see over time is mostly a story of, I would say, volatility. These organizations have grown rapidly for a while and then have experienced periods of stress and decline and, and increasing uh, uh, regulatory controls and so on. And so they, it's a boom and bust kind of world. And there was a, a while when it was assumed that they were going to take a major, play a major role in, in increasing market share, and that hasn't happened but they still are important new players, and of course their uh, fate may just have been uh, Im substantially improved with changes in the administration and the Department of Education. May, they may do pretty well for the next four years. We'll see. Have you studied the uh, reasons for that unanticipated decline among the four-profit colleges? 
Uh, yeah, it, it, it had to do both with economic downturn as well as with the increased regulatory control. The, the Senate review committees have come down hard and some made Corinthian and some major other providers in this area have had to go out of business. So, so Corinthian in, in this area, I think had five colleges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they all shut down. So, so it, it, that, it, the reasons are pretty clear. Yeah, they got into regulatory trouble or the economy turned south and so they couldn't sustain their business. The betting is with Mr. Trump, they'll be back. Yeah, that's... That's yeah. all over the press in Washington, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And enrollments, I think the big, the big picture here is the, the elephant in the room is now the community college. They now service over half of the college uh, uh, population in the Bay Area, and that's true across the country. They are the major providers. And so when you think about the modal college student you are not thinking about the undergraduate in a four-year residential program. You're talking about a commuting student who's working part-time and is trying to find his way through community college. And Mike says I need to speed up. Yes. That's head count, right? What? That's head count. Yeah. Head. Yeah. These are these are students. Okay. Uh, one of the things is, that's important. Uh, one of the things that we don't summarize here, but the book is full of, is the fact that that the, the public colleges are in trouble because of declining budgets, lack of state support, uh, constraints on federal support, and uh, increasingly uh, these systems are being privatized because more and more students are paying their way rather than being supported by, by public funds. And so what, one of the things we see here is that the public schools uh, have just not kept uh, up at all with the growing number of eligible students that are qualified to be admitted and the capacity is not there. I think there are two major ways in which the colleges have adapted. We're talking about primarily about the degree granting colleges. One way is that they've changed the composition of their faculty. The proportion of tenured faculty has gone down systematically, systematically over the 50 year period of the study. And Partly as a consequence, the uh, focus on applied and vocational degrees has in, increased in every type of college. So that even the so-called liberal public schools now have a higher proportion of their graduates coming out in vocational and uh, uh, occupational programs. And that's a fairly substantial change over time. And there's no sign of, of that changing. In terms of this fine grain work we did in talking with uh, people in the 14 colleges, we found a number of adaptive strategies they made, and one is that the, the college presidents increasingly are, do not think of themselves as just the caretaker for an ongoing institutional form called the higher education, but they think of themselves as trying to goad their faculty into being entrepreneurial and they think strategically about what is the kind of thing we can do to make a difference you know, and to get our enrollments up and so on. So they think of themselves much more than they used to as sort of managers rather than institutional governors of, of the framework. One of the things that uh, is really apparent to you is you talk about how do colleges adapt and the answer is really the colleges don't do. The subunits, the components of colleges adapt. And so the professional schools are much more agile, as you can imagine, than the humanities and sciences departments. Some of the programs are really very loosely coupled. There's a lot of differentiation across programs, and there's a lot of variety in terms of the way in which different components of the university uh, react. So that, for example, a lot of the work that uh, the, the state colleges do is through their adult education programs, uh, places like uh, um, Santa Cruz. Uh, extension. E ex extension programs, UC uh, Berkeley Extension. These are programs that are completely separate from the regular uh, uh, faculty and, and so on. They operate entirely on their own dime uh, and they, they raise more than sufficient funds and these programs are expanding enormously and again are under the radar. They're just sort of not counted as part of what higher education or what's, what uh, colleges are doing. So there's a lot of differentiation in loose coupling. And then 
the bridges that are built are, are ways in which organizations, universities in this case, or colleges, try to connect with the employers and the companies to try to, and there's a lot of early experimentation. They tried to borrow, uh, you know, uh, places like Apple would provide a set of equipment for the uh, uh, community colleges or the state colleges to use for training. And they very, very quickly found out that, that the apparatus was, uh, uh, was out of date by the time that they got them installed and, and began to do their first training. I mean, it, the pace of change was just so fast that that was a non-starter after a while. There's a lot of internships and apprenticeship programs that still go on. I think one of the major ways is the adjunct faculty, they not only provide flexibility for the college, they also provide connections and conduits to industry. Most of these people go back and forth between industry. Some of them are people that are full, uh, employed full time and teach in the, uh, in the evening. Uh, there are a lot more available when the industry turns down, so all of a sudden all the adjuncts are available, and then when the economy goes back up, all the adjuncts disappear and go to real jobs. So, so there's a lot of volatility in that sector, but there are very important connecting element between the colleges and the companies. It's probably, probably the most important. And they're the, one of the major sources of job placement now for students. It's not through the placement office, centralized placement office. It's through your teacher who has friends who know somebody in a, a local company, and that's the way you get placed. Virtually all of them have industry advisory boards in which uh, a, a group of company presidents sit with the faculty and tell them, what, what is it we need? What are the kind of work you should be doing? And so, and now I think uh, most colleges and certainly most professional schools are required to have advisory boards. It's not a question of do, do you want one, it's a question do you have to have one as a part of your. Do. Okay, and so there is also increased flexibility in the sense that there's uh, more diversity of programs, uh, uh, colleges are, are doing, spending more time uh, offering certificates as well as degrees. Uh, there's a lot more attention to trying to say if someone has been enrolled before, they don't have to re-enroll, they can simply return. There's a lot of concern with trying to loosen up uh, scheduling and enrollment possibly as they try to offer courses that are not between uh, eight and five, but in the, on the weekend or after five, and so there's a lot more flexibility of that kind. And again, the use of adjuncts. And it's back to you. Okay, thank you. I just want to mention on placement, it's just changed so dramatically. We have that in the book. It used to be you got placed through the placement agency, the institution, and now the, what the placement services are basically steering you to third parties uh, like LinkedIn and, and other ones that you yeah, get placed helping in. You, helping you prepare your resume for, 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 for those, LinkedIn. yeah. And then there's various in the Bay Area, ra racial ethnic uh, groups, that Philippine groups, Turkish groups, uh, they're getting placed through uh, racial ethnic networks increasingly uh, as they move, particularly as adults move from job to job. Okay, uh, the, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the findings in terms of uh, policy uh, in, in that sense. So California, when you look at all of this system that we look at, uh, it has seven systems of higher education. Uh, and, and they're not all systems as we, as we know. Uh, and we have our master plan, as we know, was done in 1960. I interviewed, uh, the, 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 the author of, of the master plan, and he said it would last uh, about 10 to 15 years, and here we are, it's in 217. Clark Kerr said this just before his death. So, and I, it, it, if you look at this, it, this sector we've been stressing after the first three systems, uh, you get very little understanding and intention of the bottom four uh, in this regard, and I'm, you know, we have a billion dollar initiative, uh, more than billion, for these workforce investment boards, and they are increasingly reaching out, not just uh, through the state employment department, uh, but they're reaching out through regional activities that involve community colleges and four-year systems and the K-12 system. So uh, one of our views is that nobody is and nobody understands the totality of California post-secondary education. And at the state level, there certainly is no steering mechanism uh, for this. Uh, we have no inner, you know, no, bo no institutional body. Uh, we have, um, uh, you know, in that regard, we have almost no linkages between K-12 and higher education. 
you know, so I'm in my, what, uh, 14th year of being president of the state, uni of, of the California State Board of Education, and I have not met to date the California State University Chancellor uh, White. You know, we just don't end up in the same room. So it's also detached that way. So a part of our understanding of this, I think, is that how can we think about this and make policy when we don't understand it? We have all these systems that are operating separately. Uh, and the assumption is when I get into policy discussions on higher ed, back to the three systems uh, and, and not a, a look outside or an understanding of it outside. And, so, the, and the three systems themselves are very badly yeah, yes. siloed. Uh, yeah, as we know, they are yep. not a masterpiece of integration either in yes. that sense. So, <laughs> uh, so that issue, uh, you know, and it's unlike many other states. We looked at New York State and, you know, they had private higher ed before they had public higher ed. Cornell is their land grant. Uh, so there's a, a, a very deep understanding of private higher ed in New York, how it blends in. We have a lot of it. Uh, the, uh, in here, but not much going on. Uh, demand for initial skills and reskilling exceeds supply. We looked in depth in the case studies, particularly at subfields like business administration, engineering, computer science, biotech, and uh, interviewed the people at those levels in the faculty and, and administration and so on. And the public systems have a uh, have program reviews where they do, pro particularly the community colleges, and we read those over many years. You can read the program reviews of the business administration department at City College of San Francisco. And they were almost, they were including business, they were almost all impacted at the community college and state college level. They were impacted. Cal, Cal State was just getting into it. I mean, they can't take any more students. Uh, and they can't take transfers or they take them on a very limited basis. So there was very upside in the public, a little upside in the public sector. A lot of demand for low cost public, not a lot of, not a lot of supply in these subfields and they were going other places. And moreover, the, um, uh, the institution of, uh, 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 the institutions were uh, really, uh, you know, struggling to uh, to accommodate students and, and, and they were able to place the students, that wasn't a problem. So uh, you, as I indicated, we had three CSUs. I, I, I would estimate the Bay Area now is seven and a half million. If we were running a state of seven and a half million, would we have three, three public, public uh, sector comprehensive colleges? It's crazy. I mean, Contra Costa County, uh, well over a million people largest county in the state with no four-year public higher education in the county boundaries. Try and get to Hayward at five o'clock in the afternoon from Contra Costa and so on, or, or get to San Jose from Palo Alto. It's a nightmare. Uh, expanding population. We studied the East Bay. We have studies of the subregions, East Bay, San Francisco, and the peninsula. East Bay, very different, but of course, one of the, uh, uh, very much in the logistics and transportation uh, programs that don't occur down in Santa Jose, for example. Uh, but uh, the growth in East Bay, heavily out in eastern Contra Costa County, they have no community college there. Uh, so there's, uh, we provide K-12 schools wherever the population is. Higher ed, nobody's even thinking about that, and so there's, uh, it's not following the population. And then the pace of change in the economy exceeds the capacity of the post-secondary systems to change. As the president of one ma uh, major state university said to us, I struggle to change my institution incrementally. The outside economy changes exponentially. And uh, in, in that regard, that was actually the president of San Jose State, and he went back to his native Afghanistan, found that easier to work in uh, than, <laughs> uh, and more upside for change. So that's pretty interesting. Fewer surprises. Uh, I, I've always been attracted by a paper that former President Atkinson and Saul Geyser did here, uh, calling for uh, 
uh, you know, the, the idea that we need to think outside the box of replicating the public system's whole. You know, you build a whole Cal State, you build a whole UC Merced, you build a whole community colleges. Where some hybrid institutions, branch institutions, uh, of it, it's really not uh, worked on very much. I think we need to get outside the box in, in, that, uh, in that regard. So the new post-secondary, uh, the only thing I'll say here in addition is we call for a federal, uh, for a regional approach. We do not think uh, that neither the federal nor the state governments are going to solve these regional problems. We're at the early stages of the policy cycle just trying to convince the region it has a problem and some thinking about how to approach it. The outcome of the book has been more regional activity. Uh, we are working and talking with people at Berkeley and other institutions as well to build a Bay Area Human Capital Initiative. Uh, it would initially focus heavily on students who already have a four-year degree or a certificate. There's a lot less work done in that reskilling area. These would be the goals of this initiative, which is the next uh, area here uh, to uh, try and uh, clarify the, the needs. We talked about that. Uh, to understand better from the student level what their needs are. Uh, there's a lot of pieces of data around about uh, the area we've been talking about, but there's gaps and nobody putting together the scattered data files, and we hope to play a role in that. Then build useful uh, data-driven tools for providers, seekers, employers, and funders, uh, and a clear vision for the future market. So, uh, and uh, we, uh, we have some papers on that. Uh, but that is more uh, uh, area of the future and of where the academic uh, community, we think, could participate in this in some way. Uh, and uh, I will close there. Yeah, that's <clears throat> The one thing I didn't see up there was <clears throat> a call for uh, coordination at the state level. As you know, CPEC is no more. And uh, they used to do studies that were regional studies about demand and needs by the different institutions. That's all gone. Uh, so at least within, well, obviously, they, I think it is a persuasive argument to talk about regional structures and governance. I, if you remember, Jesse Enron at one time said we should have regional uh, higher ed systems in the 1970s. But uh, uh, so uh, we do need something at the system-wide level. I mean, I'm sorry, at the statewide level, I assume, as well. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what I was implying, and, and definitely, uh, although some people called uh, killing CPAC a mercy killing, it really wasn't doing that much. And so uh, bringing something stronger back, I think, is where we need to think about this. Yep. Henry Etzkowitz, uh, Stanford S STS. So uh, I want to ask you a bit more about the, the company universities, uh, like Apple, which is now hiring faculty away from Stanford. Mm -hmm. About a decade ago, I spoke to the head of AMD, Advanced Micro Devices University. And he said, to talk about your issue of exponential change on the company side, he said, if the universities don't keep up with this, we will go for degree-granting authority. Now, needless to say, to my knowledge, that hasn't happened yet. Uh, why not? And what is the gap there that they don't really want to do it, to go full scale? Well, I think one answer is, of course, the H-1B visa program. But now that may change. So what do you think is the prospect for Apple University and the others expanding into growing their own PhD and master's students, let alone BAs? Yeah, it's another important part of the higher education provider sector. These, these corporate colleges, uh, Apple being one of the, the leaders of that area, uh, I, I, I play a real role and clearly are going to play a larger role in the future. No question about it. Londa Jose with California Competes. I guess um, this human capital initiative seems to be predicated on the idea that there would be more opportunities for regional educational institutions, even if they're not formal institutions as a UC, but something smaller, more nimble. And I'm wondering, um, as you thought about the policy implications, what you were thinking about in terms of financing it. Because the hardest part, I think, around higher education is this question of financing. <coughs> and is this intended to be financed at the regional level? Is there intended to be state support for it? And how do you think about the trade-offs between putting more money into existing institutions, such as CSU or UC, which um, and the community colleges, for sure, which are cash-strapped, and, and starting something new and different? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, and we're way too premature to grapple with that. That's uh, we're just trying to get a little lift off at this point and get some funding, actually. <laughs> so uh, we do think the H-1B visas may help us as well, the threat to those in terms of maybe we need to educate the people that are already here rather than importing them. Uh, and, and so that seems to be giving us an afterburner. But yeah, those are great questions and questions we, we, uh, we hope to, uh, uh, to work on in, in that regard. I, I don't think... I guess I would say we don't know enough to begin to grapple exactly with those kinds of questions, but they are important and will come down the line. I'm a historian and I'm struck by how similar what you're describing is to what happened in high schools a century ago. Um, a couple of things occurred to me. I mean, the vocational pressures that were placed by businesses, uh, the role of ethnic groups in placing and employment placing. Uh, have you thought about that? That, in fact, one of the things that you're describing um, is a pushing up of the kinds of employment pressures that existed at one point around high schools now taking place around anything that's called a college? You're the K-12 expert. Yeah, I'm the, right, the K <laughs> Boy, I don't... Uh, I, I can see some of your analogy, but the structure, for example, of the American high school has barely changed. Uh, and, Really yeah, and so we have all these institutions from Udacity to truck driver school and so on out there in, in, the, in the higher ed is so much more nimble in institutional structure, adjunct faculty. Uh, you don't have to go through the CT, California Teacher Commission certification. I don't mean today. I, I mean the comparison with a century ago when, when there was actual vocational education and courses in high schools that, that were eventually dropped in the 1960s and 70s because they weren't able to adapt uh, effectively. Uh -huh. And what frightens me about the picture that you've portrayed is precisely that what the fate of what's happened to high schools. Yeah, well, it's sort of a fate of non-change, of not a, a non-adaptation. That's what your point is, yeah. And I think, yeah, I, I mean, if it, if there's demand if, for higher ed that we've been talking about is not satisfied, it spills over into all kinds of other institutions. I, I, I think a more similar analogy on your high school point would be the movement towards privatiz quote, privatization of K-12. Uh, that it's not nimble enough, uh, and all we're hearing about, we need vouchers. And so uh, that, that may come home to roost. Um, yeah, we are, yeah. Right, right away. Mm -hmm. I, yep. I had two observations. One was, um, it sounded like in your discussion of tech, you were really talking um, uh, the sort of high techs, you know, the, the chart that you drew of computers and the evolution of the whole computer driven economy. And the piece that's missing for me there is the healthcare sector, yeah, particularly right, given right, that you've got UCSF right. yeah. as one of your institutions yes. in the Bay Area. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. we, we uh, the health sector is huge and growing, and and, and it's the place where you have institutions that are um, that are largely professionally focused and and right. try to be very nimble in yeah, adapting we, to the labor market. Yeah, and um, creating so many different job structures than in the past. And the job world is changing. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. the needs in that world are changing at least right. as fast as what's happening in tech. Yeah, we looked at biotech, but not at health as you were talking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, and that's an area in which many of the colleges, particularly the community colleges, have really stepped up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the, you've got degree inflation in that world. Yes. The, it, the associate it, it, degree it, doesn't get you very far exactly anymore. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. um, oh. But the other, the other question I had was, how is, is what you're describing as the human capital initiative not another layer of hoops as opposed to something that fosters nimbleness? Uh, well... I would think that if you had a better handle on where the market is going, uh, that you would create more innovation. And so, the, it's the I mean I think the concept is that there's the more that we if more, better we understand this, the more we can think about different ways of satisfying it. And we don't believe that building whole new CSUs and UCs and community colleges is, pr is probably the way to go in terms of the state's budget and the state's capacity. So uh, I would think that it would lead to more 
uh, uh, not more status, uh, status, more stasis, but more uh, thinking about innovation and ideas and bringing this unknown sort of dark sector that we talked about into the public policy realm would be very important uh, to foster that and how we partly regulate it. I mean, right now it's, it's in many ways a wild west of regulation uh, in terms of, of, of what you get and, uh, and, and what the standards are. So that would, that would tend to uh, maybe uh, s make it more standardized, but I think we're, we're looking at, at, at more diverse models that are lower cost uh, with quicker turnaround and all that kind of stuff because that's what the employment economy is, is signaling to yeah. us. Uh, but I think, uh, if I, as I understand the lab work, we, which Mike's much more uh, involved in than I am, I think it's, it's much more about information gathering and information sharing and not about control at this point, not about oversight, mm -hmm. but, but trying to provide more uh, transparency to what's going on for everybody. Thank you. Uh, Maria Sloy, uh, visiting from Dublin City University, Ireland, and fascinated by this uh, discussion. Um, at the, you started by the very interesting description of the two fields, basically, the higher education and then the um, tech fields, and how, how different they are in so many ways. And I don't know if this would be the situation here in the Bay Area, but I mean, certainly in many parts of Europe, um, employers are reducing their investment in uh, continuing education for their employees. In other words, they're not spending as much as they used to. So in looking at this regional engagement, I wonder how are you going to get the, these tech companies to actually participate and contribute? We see philanthropy, but from the research that you've been engaged with, or do you see any evidence that, yes, they want to play with the uh, higher education institutions. Yeah. I, I would only say that this uh, human capital initiative is coming from the top of Stanford University uh, and from the vice provost's office, not from the ed school and so on. So initially, we have some pretty tight relations with some of the technology uh, community down there. So I, I, our hope is really that we're marshalling uh, uh, that, that that leadership. So the leader, uh, the vice president for teaching and learning, John Mitchell, who used to head our computer science department at Stanford, is actually the uh, the key uh, university executive in this. So initially, we're going to try and work from some of that c contact base, which is deep and long. And we have a, uh, some quite a bit of data in the book about Stanford's own. Our engineering department has offered offshore degrees ever since the 70s and before the 70s. So initially, we're going to play the contact game from the top down of Stanford. And but if I understand your point, Maria, the, um, I think the companies, uh, if, if you look at, uh, I'm an avid reader of The Economist magazine, and they've done major surveys on this. And they suggest that companies are, are, are increasingly not providing scholarships for their students to college and, you know, that, and, and tuition back up. They're providing their own training. They're, providing their own, they're building their own colleges, as, as was suggested. And so they, they've given, in some ways, sort of given up on the, number one, they don't want to lose their employees. You send somebody off to Harvard and they won't come back. And so they don't want to lose them. And so they're, they're maintaining control of that. And so they're, they're doing it much more in-house rather than, rather than outsourcing. Yeah, the Economist issue about three weeks ago was a special issue in the, men, in the middle, special section on what we're talking about. That's as good as I have seen. The, 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 if you're interested in this, take a look at that. Uh, they, uh, they, this is not just a brief article. It's a whole section. It was terrific. Uh, and. I thought uh, gave an also an international flavor to this analysis. I'd just like to uh, uh, reinforce the idea that even though this is a regional discussion, the federal government, at least up until maybe this administration, is a dominant player in the region. No, no that, and I'm surprised that you didn't put that in any of the slides. The research universities would disappear as research universities without the feds, no, I, I particularly UCSF that. across the bay, yeah. and Berkeley and Stanford yeah, as we well. Have, we have long sections. And, and the, the for-profits, if they were deprived of tuition yeah, for students, dead. would 
disappear as well. You're so that big gorilla correct. has to be uh, You're considered. You're absolutely correct. We have a Although, long uh, section dis describing the role of public policy and public financing. You're, and you're absolutely right. Yeah. 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 We have yeah. some of that. I know we could go on for a very long time, and I think you do have an opportunity to try to corral our speakers. There is lunch served. I want to thank Diana for all her help in setting this up, and thank our speakers for a terrific presentation. Thank <laughs> you.